I decided to come down to Galveston Beach to hang out with Lone Star Paramotor out of San Antonio. We're here at the beach this week because we're teaching new students how to fly and I'm just as an observer checking it out. Um, while I'm here, I've had a few students ask me some questions. One of them is, what are wings made out of? And so I did a little research and what I found out was that France has really good food. Hippies love having sex in tents and goo. A man named Goo. For those of you that are interested in the propeller lights, stick around to the end of this video and I'll tell you where we are on production as well as how to enter to win your own free pair of propeller lights. For now, let's go ahead and talk about wing fabric. The story of this is quite fascinating and it starts about 90 years ago in the 1930s. The mid-1930s was a great time to be alive if you were a tyrannical dictator. But not so much if you were an infantryman. You see, the U.S. military had a problem. The fabrics that were used to make up the uniforms of soldiers just wasn't durable enough and the army specifically wanted to clothe their troops in a tougher apparel. After all, the world was becoming ever more unstable and, thanks to tyrannical dictators, war had already broken out in Europe. So, the U.S. Army reached out to a chemical company who was experimenting with making thread out of petroleum products. That company, DuPont, would end up creating a product known as nylon in 1939. This amazing new yarn, which was quickly woven into fabrics, would bless the world with items such as pantyhose, stockings, lingerie, and of course, military uniforms. Interestingly, pantyhose, or nylon stockings, hit the shelves in New York City on May 15, 1940. There was such a high demand for it initially that the military could not get enough nylon material to make the needed uniforms for their soldiers. And when World War II broke out, the government levied all production of nylon, which caused a national nylon shortage. Women's hosiery was so hard to come by, even the older ones, which were made out of silk or rayon, that women started applying leg makeup with eyebrow pencils to make it appear like they were wearing stockings. An entire leg makeup market was started. Lingerie was also in short supply as the primary ingredient for making women's undergarments was silk. And, as it turns out, Silk was also the primary fabric for parachutes. And if you're going to get involved in a world war, chances are you're going to have soldiers jump out of airplanes. These soldiers or paratroopers are not fully equipped without a parachute. So just like nylon, the government grabbed up all the available supply for silk as well and single-handedly shut down the women's underwear industry, which at the time was a mere inconvenience as all their men were overseas fighting tyrannical dictators. 
But silk parachutes were very expensive, and so the military reached out to DuPont once again to see if they could make this nylon material strong enough to replace the silk in parachutes. Somewhere along the line, and no one knows who or where, someone decided that cross-hatching thicker strands of nylon roughly an eighth inch apart would stop rips from tearing farther. Thus, Ripstop was born. But Ripstop wasn't used outside of the military until much after the war was over. You see, once the war was over, women's leggings and lingerie were back in production, just in time for the men to return from war. And the outcome? Well, we call them the baby boomers. Soon, the baby boomers would become teenagers, and as teenagers, they would grow up with a different set of rules. Living outside in tents and watching rock bands was the status quo for these young adults. But unfortunately, the tents used by their fathers in the military were too bulky and heavy. This hippie wonderless generation needed a lighter, tougher tent and backpack. And once again, DuPont came to the rescue by creating more durable and lighter forms of the nylon thread. Now, armed with a new waving technique known as ripstop, fabric manufacturers around the globe started creating textiles to serve the outdoor camping lifestyle. And what do hippies do in tents? Well, they do just what their fathers did when they came home from the war. Except this generation believed in burning women's undergarments and not flaunting them. But it wasn't just love, sex, and rock and roll, no sir. They wanted to explore the world from above, and in 1962, a ripstop patent was filled for the purpose of using it for parachutes. Soon afterwards, in 1966, after Domina Jalbert was issued a patent, the sport of paragliding was born. Albeit, the term paragliding wasn't actually used until the middle of the 1980s. Well, I'm finally back home from the beach. One thing that's bad about flying in the beach is you always get sand in your wing and being home at least lets me get that sand out of it. And just in case you think this video is about women's underwear, well, that's about all we'll say about the subject because in the 1960s, they started burning the stuff. It wasn't until the 1980s that it became popularized again. But back to paragliding wings. Between the 1960s and the 1990s, there wasn't a whole lot of improvement in ripstop for paragliding or parachute fabric. In fact, there was barely any improvement in spinnaker, the things they use on yachts and sails. But most of the companies that produced it between the 1960s and the 1990s are no longer companies. They don't exist anymore or were bought up by companies like Porcher or Porcher Sport, a company out of Lyon, France, who is known for great food and not for marketing because their marketing material includes a flying moose and a beaver that's a scientist. Vous êtes parapentiste et vous ignorez la technique de fabrication du tissu qui vous porte Eh bien, aujourd'hui, justement, nous ouvrons les portes de notre usine. Actually, it wasn't a moose and a beaver, it was a goat and a beaver. Perhaps I'm thinking of another cartoon from around that time about a flying moose. At any rate, the people of Lyon, France, obviously focused more on eating than they did marketing, which is how Lyon became known as the gastronomic capital of the world. But this video isn't about underwear, cartoons, or food. It's about the fabric used for making paragliding wings. And the company that had dominated the paragliding textile market from the 1980s is Porcher Sport. Porcher Industries was founded in 1912, a company that specialized in the weaving of natural silks. In 1950, they expanded into weaving fabrics from glass yarns, and in 1984, burst onto the paragliding world by acquiring Griffin Dew Industries, a company that was a huge player in weaving many types of textiles, including ripstop. The ripstop manufacturing was spun off, forgive the pun, to create Porcher Sport, and oddly, Gryffindor still makes fabrics for women's underwear to this day. 
but we'll not revisit that subject. In 1993, Porcher Industries merged with several companies to create NCV Industries, which led to production plants being opened up around the world in places like Japan, the US, China, the Czech Republic, and even Russia. Porcher's Paraglider Textile, named Skytex, was the primary fabric on almost every paraglider and paramotor wing for decades. The science behind how Porcher Spork makes this fabric is nothing less than something out of the high-tech industry. Millions and millions of dollars have been invested in the R&D department at Porcher, and it shows by touting fabrics that contain specifications that no other ripstop manufacturer has been able to reproduce. Well, that was until a man came along named Goo. Dominic Goo. Mr. Dominic Goo founded Dominico Textiles in the year 2000. Obviously, he named the company after his first name and not his last, which in hindsight was probably the best call. Anyway, they started off by making ripstop fabrics for tents, but due to the South Korean financial crunch at the time, they needed to expand their product offerings. So, when Dominico entered the paragliding textile market, they almost immediately found a niche by competing directly with the high-end fabrics made by Porcher. They named their paragliding fabric Dokdo, which in Korean means solitary island, a, a strange name for a fabric line, but it's still better than naming it something like goo. At any rate, about 2012, Dominico had disrupted Porcher's monopoly on the market by producing ripstop fabrics that were lightweight and less expensive than Porcher. Initially, almost all the wing manufacturers used Docto fabrics, but due to some quality concerns, most wound up either going back using Porcher fabrics or using a combination of the two. Not much is known about the quiet South Korean textile manufacturer. But what is known is that their marketing department is even worse than Porcher's, if you can imagine that. Domenico's website is this, with the broken image at the top, and that image, well, it's supposed to be an under construction picture, but they couldn't even get that right. But at least they're not making videos of flying goats and beavers. There is a lot more you can learn about the fabric that these are made of. In fact, over the next few videos, I'll be covering how that fabric is made, what special coatings they use, how to read the technical data that comes with your manual about the fabrics. This way you'll know why certain wings might be more expensive than another or how to take care of the specific fabrics that are included in your wing. In the meantime, I'd like to cover this. If you've been following this channel for any amount of time, you know that we've been in development of these lighted props and trying to get them into production. If you look closely at them, you can see that the lights are actually fully integrated into the propeller itself. The hub contains the controller as well as the batteries, and all of this is controlled through an app on your phone. We should have a small production run of these late winter, early spring. But if you don't want to wait that long, you can win a pair of these for free. And to learn more about that, let's throw it over to Evil Villain number 42. Hey guys, Evil Villain number 42 here. As you know, Chris loves crazy socks. And every time he flies, he takes a picture, he uploads it to Instagram to show you what all he's got. I also know that he just showed you a really cool pair of props. So, I decided that I'd like to make it a little bit fun and in return show you guys some love for liking and subscribing to his channel. To win the props, send some socks. The details are in the description below. Subscribe to YouTube, subscribe to Instagram, send your t-shirt size. We want your t-shirt size because if he uses your socks and posts them on Instagram, we're going to send you a free t-shirt. All the details are below. Thanks again and good luck. And by the way, I approved all underwear shots in this video. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to watch the video. I really appreciate it. I'm not kidding when I say that this video took me over a month to put together for you. So if you liked it, 
If you could click that like button, leave a comment below and let me know what you thought of it. Also, if you're not a subscriber, please go ahead and subscribe to this channel. I look forward to all of the awesome socks that I'm gonna be getting in the mail and good luck to you on winning the props. Once again, thanks for taking the time to watch the video.